the mules are in the corral. Welcome to Mule Talk, and I'm Cindy K. Roberts, your host. On this episode of Mule Talk, we have back our author, TV personality, and world-renowned mule trainer, Meredith Hodges of the Lucky Three Ranch. Welcome back. Glad to be back. We've been talking a lot about mules and donkeys in the movies and TV shows, so that really fascinates me. Does the Lucky Three Ranch participate in filming? We do more than participate. We actually make films. This all started when I was just a five-year-old and my parents gave me a brownie camera when I was that age. And so I started taking pictures and I got fascinated with taking pictures. Oh, I was very bad at it. And my mother said, well, you need to do better. How can you even tell what these pictures are? You know, they're all fuzzy. And I said, well, I know what they are. I took the picture. <laughs> Good enough. <laughs> you know, and she goes, well, you have to take pictures so other people can tell what they are. You know, and I thought about it and I went, okay. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. So I practiced and I got better and I got really interested in it. And the other thing that they gave me was they gave me a blank diary. I learned to write what was going on daily in this diary. And so that's where I decided that text was a good idea too. And, and these two things, the pictures and the diary reminded me of what I was doing in my life. And a lot of times it was really fun to just look back and see what I was doing. But when I got involved in mules in 1973, those skills came in really, really good to remind me, you know, where I was at, what was happening with these mules so that I, I wouldn't spend a whole lot of time just getting mad. I would kind of uh, block on the time that I spent with them, knowing that I could go back and read in my diary how far I'd gotten that day and take it up from there and I would remember what things went wrong and what things went right. This is how I went ahead and managed to train them, but it's by documenting all the interactions with my mules and donkeys in preparation for learning the best way to manage and train. I could actually remember what I had done that didn't work, and I remembered what did work. And so that's kind of how I approached things. I kept diaries. I wrote articles for equestrian publications internationally from 1982, and I'm still doing it. I started out with 25 different ones and had to write those articles and mail them in the mail and type them out with carbon paper. I didn't have a computer back then and so I was determined to get this out there because of all of the rumors that people had about mules being stubborn and hard to work with oh, and yeah. aggressive and all those nasty things. But my interaction with them, I was afraid when my mother asked me to train her mules because that's what I thought they were all about. I liked horses. I didn't want to mess with those mules because of what I heard. <laughs> and she gave me an older one to start with named Molly, and Molly and I clicked right away. Oh, cool. I saw that Molly was very engaging. She was very affectionate. Her resistance to doing things was not mean and was not stubborn. It was more like, well, I don't know what you're asking, you know, so can you be a little clearer on what you're asking here, you know? <laughs> and so I started started writing articles about that, about how how I managed to have a conversation with her, of course, in a lot of different ways, body language and being clear the way I was presenting things. I started writing articles about every interaction that I had with the mules. And in 1993, I had quite a few articles that I could put together on training mules and donkeys in every aspect, management, grooming, feeding, all of these different things, I got all of the training articles consolidated and put them together and published my first book, Training Mules and Donkeys, A Logical Approach to Long Ears. I hired a production company when I decided that that book, it was kind of an overview of everything that I had done, but there wasn't a lot of detail in it at any given stage. So, And people wanted to see what was going on, so I decided to do some manuals that were much more detailed. Detailed, and I did videos, a 
10 tape video series and we did those from 1997 to 2017 and I started out doing those 10 videos in VHS and later upgraded to DVDs. By 2009 I had published two more hardbound books, A Guide to Raising and Showing Mules and that one had all of the management issues in it that were not training related and then donkeys do things a little differently than even mules and horses do. They have different responses to different things that you try to get them to do. And one of the things donkeys will tell you is how to be patient. And I thought, you know, a lot of people were losing their sense of humor in all of this because mules and donkeys really make you wait on a lot of stuff. So that's how you learn patience with them. But in the donkey training book, I decided that it might be a good thing to have Bonnie Shields do some cartoons in it to kind of alleviate the pressure. (laughs) And so I did. I did. And and Bonnie did a whole lot of training cartoons that also went into the two manuals, Training Without Resistance, which corresponds with videos one through seven, and Equine Management and Training, which corresponds with tapes seven through ten. And then I submitted that book for awards and I didn't get anything, but I got a note that said that it wasn't very, very uh, professional because of all these cartoons. So I, I submitted it to, (laughs) I thought, well, they just don't know donkeys and mules. They don't understand that you have to have a sense of humor and those cartoons are very appropriate for that book. So I resubmitted it to the independent publishers and we won a silver award with it with them because they actually got it. You know, they actually realized that, yeah, you know, you got to have that. In the 2009, I produced the manual Equus Revisited with a matching DVD, which was also a training thing to add to the training series because so many people were getting in trouble with mules and donkeys by trying to train them the way that the horses were being trained. Oh, yeah. Everybody is very familiar with getting into the round pen, chasing them around, making them keep going, sure. disengaging the hindquarters, keep them moving and all of that. But you do that with a mule and it becomes a game. And it's going <laughs> to it's gonna be a very frustrating game because where a horse, you know, when you stop, turn your back on them and wait in the middle, the horse will come up to you. Sure. But the mules don't. Right. They go, when are you going to start the game again? (laughs) (laughs) You you don't really get anywhere with them. And then if you do the things that a lot of these trainers did by roping feet and uh, or even roping them, you know, and stuff, then they take exception to it and they think you're crazy for even doing that. And then you get a whole lot of resistance from the mules. And this is why people think that they're stubborn. They're going, they're not acting like they're supposed to. You know, but (laughs) they're not going by the script. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so speaking of scripts, I thought, well, these books I'm writing and these manuals I'm writing still aren't detailed enough. I decided that I was going to publish. Well, first of all, I thought the kids needed to learn how to handle the animals when they're young so that they don't get this idea. You can go in and bully them into this stuff because that's what it looks like when you start them in a round pen. And the mules know it. It's just a game to them. If you look at Pirelli's stuff, he talks about these games with your horses. Play the seven games. Well, mules are fine with playing seven games, but it isn't going to teach them very much (laughs) except how to avoid you. Then, you know, you don't get the result that you want, and then you think they're stubborn. Then you think they're resistant. Then you think they have no personalities except obstinates, you know. And that's, I think, where all of these things come from that people think about mules. So I kind of made it my mission to go out there and prove that when you have the right approach and you have the right things in mind when you're doing your training with these mules that they will respond to you. Number one is they need to have the training approach in a logical and sequential way so that it's easy for them to move from one step to the other. In other words, you have to break those steps down into very, very small steps. And when you're talking about starting in a round pen, you're assuming that their body is ready to go on a circle 
and stay upright with equal weight over all four feet on a circle. And that is very difficult to do. That's why I start them. And I learned this from my dressage instructor that I got way back in 1986. Because I had a mule that had been started in raining. And every time he made a mistake, which he did when he was doing flying lead changes, he was taught to run off. So every time he perceived he was making a mistake, he ran off. And when things Things got difficult for him. He ran off. So she started me in an hourglass pattern of moving from the four corners of the arena to the center, back to the four corners of the arena again. And I thought, you know, that's going to work really well with leading training. And with Richard Shrake's consultation that I did with him and developing the elbow pull so that they would be forced to stay in good posture, but it only restricted their good posture. It would not let them raise their head high enough to hollow their back in their neck. It would keep them in good posture. I thought that that was something we could do with the leaning training and we would do it, you know, the bridle was attached to the surf single and the elbow pull was attached to the bridle and the surf single. But we use a halter under the bridle to attach the lead rope so that we don't interfere with that posture while we're walking around in that pattern. And what they can learn in that pattern is really good. They learn how to keep their attention on you because a lot of times if you're just leading an animal freely and you go take walks and you think that's fine it doesn't address their physical development and it's really important that when they graduate to the round pen that they physically know how to keep that weight over all four feet and maintain their good posture because then they're going to perform it correctly and they're going to build on that at the core and when I talk about core I'm talking about all those elements not just muscles but ligaments tendons and soft tissue, cartilage in the joints and all of that so that it is symmetrically developed around the bones. People go, I'm in, my animal's in really good condition because look at he's all bulked up and he's got bulk muscle all over. But hey, bulk muscle over no core is just like you putting on a fat suit and trying to do stuff. You're inhibited by the weight and the shape of the bulk muscle that's over a weak core and that core needs to be strong and it can only be established during leading training in the hourglass pattern because when you're doing that you know the reason that for instance when you're leading them on a walk or something like that they're not in good posture so when you ask them to stop their body keeps moving and they won't stand still next to you and they do circles around you and they drag you off and they do all of these things and again you get the idea that they're just being obstinate but they're not being obstinate. Their bodies aren't ready for what you're asking them to do. They're trying to get comfortable. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly right. And so that prompted me to create the training tip because those training tips, I can break those down into small enough steps so that you can identify all the small steps that need to be done leading up to the lunging in the round pen. And so those steps correspond with those manuals that I did, the first two blue ones, Training Without Resistance and A Guide to Raising and Showing Mules. It corresponds with all of those. In the manuals, I was able to put a whole lot more things in the appendix so that couldn't put in the training tips or in the DVDs in those manuals. So the manuals have more than the videos do even. So you're getting more. My products overlap. They do not repeat. They just get deeper and deeper and deeper so that if you have questions you'll get them answered. And when I was with the production companies, we started doing these training tips and I was getting a little aggravated with them because one of the things they were doing is, oh, okay, you wrote the script. This is how we're going to do it. And they'd come out here with, they'd come out here with a whole crew, that the assistant to the producer who took all the notes and the lighting guys and all these people. And bear in mind, they all had to get paid. You know, so even though I wrote the script, I didn't get a break on cost at all. So I'm having these guys do these and and they're shooting from the script for the first for the DVDs and then second for the training tips. 
And every time they had a new project, they had a new series of, of shots we had to get. So we had a, a shot list. And I had two guys, the two guys that were with me when we did the DVDs, and we didn't do it so much with the production crew. We, I said, we got to hire these guys because these guys did the DVDs. So I want them to film the mules to make sure that we get everything. And the producer goes, well, they've got to be able to do what I say to do. My two videographers were sitting on top of an open shed in this large 12 area. They were filming the mules and then the producer was on the ground and she was reading the script. Well, we need this and we need that. And the mules were out there and I was, you know, doing things with some, them some of the time. Some of the time there was stuff about what they do when they're playing and when they're loose and everything. She, okay, turn them loose now. And and they go ahead and run around and do this, their running thing. <laughs> and then she gets in front of the shed and looks up at the guys and goes, cut! And the guys look down at me and I said, keep going, keep going. She doesn't know that they don't start playing till they're done running. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And she goes, but Meredith, you're wasting tape. I said, no, I'm not wasting tape. I'm paying for it. Don't worry about it. I'm not worried about that because it's going to cost me more to have you to come back out here and redo what you miss. It makes much more sense to let these animals do what they're going to do because they are free spirit and they do have their own mind and they will do what they want to, by golly, and you can't force it. That's one thing I've learned about mules. You cannot force it. With a horse? Yeah, you might be able to do that. You know, and that's how they do it. And, you know, when they go ahead and get these horses and, and mules and stuff, notice that when they do that, they usually save mules for the background stuff, like pulling wagons and stuff. And they're in the background, but they don't have starring roles. And I think that's because they can't control them enough right. so that they can have yeah. starring roles. I mean, there's more of it happening now than what was happening before, you know. So, you know, since we've been doing this, this training series, people have learned a whole lot more about it. I worked with those production companies and they about drove me crazy. And I tried to get them to do these. I made it to 67 training tips in 2017. I said, oh, okay, so I told you three years ago that we were going to do this 126 training tips and you've only done 67 in three years. I said, that's not acceptable. I have other things I want to do. I've got several documentaries on the on the docket that I want to do. And at this rate, we're not going to get it done. Well, I know what they were thinking. Oh, yeah, we've got job security here. We're going to get paid for as long as it takes us to do this, you yeah. know? I'm just like, look, I don't have that kind of money. A lot of people think I do. But I don't. My dad died in 2000 and he left a finite amount of money to go into a trust fund sure. uh, for me and my brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. And it's divided. And, and then his widow had two other kids. So it's divided not five ways, but seven ways. And we get a finite amount of money every month. But if I was to live off of that, I couldn't even pay the ranch bills, much less do this this stuff. I have to be thrifty about what I'm doing. So I fired them. I decided after $7 million and working with production companies from, let's see, it would have been, oh gosh, from 1997 it was that I was working with them because we did do the training DVDs together. Right. And right. she didn't like my guys. She didn't like my video guys because they wouldn't follow orders. <laughs> <You know? laughs> she yeah. goes, well, well, they're hard to work with. I go, well, I guess if you try to micromanage them, they would be. But we did manage to get the documentaries done about Bishop Mule Days. We did three of them. And we did one called Walk On Exploring Therapeutic Riding. And we went out to Hearts and Horses and we filmed out there and we did that. So we had those, but I, I wanted to go forward and do more intensive training. And the one that I really was keen on doing next was the rock and roll video because I rescued those two draft mules and I took them because they were the worst case scenario and if my training methods were going to work it was going to work on them and if that came out all right then I would have proved everything. In 2017, I asked my crew if they thought we could handle all this stuff. And my crew is composed of two guys, three girls here on the ranch, 
two videographers that live in Fort Collins and my graphics artist that lives in Greeley and the Jasper mascot and he helps with social media sometimes and he's in Colorado Springs. So that's not too many people considering how many people those production companies brought out, oh, sure. you know. I thought, I thought that, you know, I could greatly reduce expenses by getting rid of those production crews and then I could afford bonuses for my crew for doing extra work. And so I I asked my crew if they could pick up the slack if they could do all these jobs that these production companies were taking care of. And they all said, yeah, let's give it a go. Let's try it. So we dispersed the jobs. And the first thing we did was I wanted 126 training tips. We went ahead and did those and we got them all done. And we got the last ones done from 68 to 126. And then we realized that the ones that the production company did were not satisfactory and we had to redo those. So we actually did all 126 training tips on the smaller crew. We also did 31 Long Ears music videos to put on the website. Oh, yeah. I had a total of 195 Mule Crossing articles that I could post on the website. I had four Long Ears diaries from doing work with the rescues, the donkeys, and so I had the two mini donkeys. I had two large standard donkeys. And so with the mini donkeys, we have one donkey for two of them. We have a diary for Chastity's Challenges, which is a, a large standard donkey that I bought that was overweight, severely overweight with broken crest. And then I had a Wrangler's Donkey Diary because Wrangler was one of those spoiled children that never got formal training. <laughs> he grew up. He grew up with a little girl. And she let him do everything he wanted to do, oh you know. <laughs> At nine years old, the little girl decided that she wanted a horse. <laughs> well, I can understand why she wanted a horse, because <laughs> by that time, I would think he was becoming rather uncorrigible. Right. And so you. to get her a horse, the parents had to sell the donkey. They had other donkeys. and. So Wrangler was the one they chose to sell, and I picked him up because I was missing little Jack Horner at that time. He mm -hmm. died in 2014, and this was 2017 when I bought Wrangler. Yeah. I had to have a gray donkey in little Jack Horner's pen. I was getting a little psycho about not seeing a gray donkey in that pen. And I wasn't getting over it anytime soon, so I thought this might be a really good therapeutic thing to do. And as it turned out, you know yourself, mules and donkeys are very therapeutic when you got the right ones. And mm -hmm. and he, yeah. he, he was perfect. He was just perfect. The other thing was, with these production companies, I was also combining all of these training DVDs that I had and breaking them down and making TV shows for RFD TV. And I was on RFD TV for 11 years. I thought, well, I got to start making some money back and stuff. So I talked to them and I said, uh, well, I'd like to put some video on demand on my website and go ahead and run these TV shows there too, as well as on TV. Because people are only getting one show a week on TV. And this way I could put them up and they could watch any show anytime they wanted to. And they said, well, Meredith, you can't do that. I said, why can't I do that? Because did you look at your contract? Oh, boy. <laughs> in, in the contract, it says we have that right. And so you can't put them on your website, but we can, we can do that and put them on the RFD website. And I thought, well, I don't like this. Yeah. And then I read, I read the paragraph, and it included electronic games and all of the things that you could go on and do from the intellectual property that I founded, that I created, and they want to take all of the rights to all of that and do that so that their pockets are lined, but my pockets aren't. Uh -oh. And I thought, this is this is not good. So I told RFD TV, I think I'm done with you too. I remember a time when people used to buy TV programming. The the people at the at the TV stations would buy individual programming from individual creators. Now you you know when I went on RSD TV, I had to pay them 
to be on TV. And I always thought that was a little sideways. Right. You know, uh, anyway. So, you know, after 11 years, I, I thought, uh, okay, I'm not going to be on TV. I used to think it'd be really cool to be a TV star or a movie star and all of that. But <laughs> that all just went in the tank when I had to negotiate these contracts and everything and realized I didn't own my own intellectual property like I thought I did. Well, I had the copyright to it, but I couldn't make any money off of it. You needed an agent. <laughs> no, I didn't really need an agent. I had plenty of agents built into those production companies. I even it. had a publicist. She drove me crazy. Oh, Meredith, you don't have to do anything on this shoot. All you have to do is sit in this chair and watch, and Lori will take care of your makeup and, and your hair and all of that. I went, oh, this is not me. I, I can't do this. This is not me. This is not going to work. So I thought, but if I can build up my website, you know, and get going on that, that is me. And I, I know by now with all this experience with these production companies, I was listening. I was learning. And I knew that I could I could get my crew to do everything that they were doing. I could do whatever they couldn't do. And whatever we couldn't do, we could learn. There you go. We're all people, and, and we're smart people. We know how to learn. That's the most important thing. And that's what I try to do with all products that I produce. I try to put them in a context where people can learn no matter where they're coming from. They can know absolutely nothing and start with my products, and they're done in such a way that if you're stumped on something, it's not going to overwhelm you because the, if you can master the first step, then the second step's going to be easy because you're already prepped for it. And that's the way that I do it. I told RFD, I says, well, I'm giving notice now. And they said, well, we better give you notice too. And I said, what do you mean by that? They said, there's another clause in your contract. It's a non-compete clause and you can't put anything on your website that's in this contract for two years. So I can't do the video on demand on my website for two years or electronic stuff or anything new that, that was supposed to go to RFTT. And I said, that's right. And I said, well, okay, then if those are the rules, I'll play by the rules. And I didn't put anything on my website. But while I was doing my website, I thought, you know, I, I got to maintain a good attitude. I can't spend two years being mad at them. Right. So, exactly. you know, yeah. And, and the production companies, when they constructed my website, Oh, my God, they create a horror. They told me I couldn't do things that I wanted to do. I said, well, can't we just have, you know, all of these different categories and a drop-down menu so that if people were looking for something, they can find it really easily. And, oh, you can't have that many pages. I can't? <laughs> no, they don't do that. Uh, That's not the way the website works, you know. Oh boy. And then I said, well, how about putting a link, you know, from this page to another page? Well, you can only have so many of those, you know. And I'm like, oh, this sounds like BS to me. So we spent that two years revamping that website because I was getting complaints about how it was so hard to navigate that people couldn't find anything on it. And so they they really didn't really like that. But in conforming that website, I learned a whole lot about, you know, in constructing it, about how to get people that didn't learn the same way to the same end. When we had filmed all of those videotapes uh, on training, a full training, for instance, I didn't have a full to train when I decided to do those. The youngest one I had was three months old, and that was Sir Guy. But I thought, you know what? They're still going to act the same way. So when I decided to do all these videotapes on training, I decided that I'm not going to set anything up perfectly like they do in the movies or like they do on the training videos that the horse trainers do. They always show you what the end result is, but they don't tell you how to get there. And what they do a lot of times is a lot of things behind the barn that you never see. Right. You know, they don't like giving away their secrets. Exactly. But I thought... 
I'm going to give away everything. I'm going to go ahead and let people see what it really takes to do this. And if I'm being abusive, then I better change my approach Mm -hmm. so that it doesn't offend anybody, but it gets the result from the mule. And that's what I learned from these mules. In this article that is going to accompany this interview, I actually have pictures underneath the whole list of training videos that I did, the list of the books that I did. and But the most important thing is seeing those pictures of those initial onset shoots when I did, say, foal training. Because the picture you're going to see in the first picture that we did was with little Sir Guy. We didn't just take off and start doing the showmanship training. We introduced him to that great big four-foot white circle thing that reflects the light. And so this, from my training tips and videos, is what you call (laughs) uh, turning fear into curiosity. So instead of going, you got to come over here or have him just run into it after he's done showmanship training, I build on things in a logical and sequential order. And the first thing is to introduce them to the environment. I have always led them around the arena, led them around the round pen, led them through the hourglass pattern first and let them inspect everything. Even the little cones that are in the hourglass pattern, we stop, we look at them, you know, so that they know I'm not going to throw anything at them. So when we do those initial introductions, that's what I film. So everything in this whole list that I have of all the things I produced, when you're seeing the video, it's the first time these animals have seen these things and I do that so that people will know what to expect when we shoot photos and videos I found that it, it's very important to have a nice library to draw from and to shoot beyond what any project is and so what we do we shoot photos and videos of everything we do every day. We keep diaries, we log everything, and then we use these materials for multiple projects going forward, which shortens the time needed to do the various projects because there's very little shooting pieces involved, and it lowers the cost of production. It expands the use of everything we do, from articles to training tips to advertising to social media to new video projects and anything else we might dream up. If you can dream it, you can do it. You just need to learn how to be super organized and efficient about the way that you work and still continue training with the equines as needed to add all the intellectual property that we're composing to our intellectual property library. We all age and the ranch work changes. There are always new things to shoot and film. You asked about how we select animals for the scenes. We just take them according to their level of training because the training is built up to that point. So they will be ready to do whatever it is that we ask them to do. The training that we do is training for everything. And by the time they're at the advanced level, they can do anything. Any kind of trick training, we don't do singular trick training like people do. We, this whole program evolves in a way that will get, get them to trust you and to go ahead and try to do everything that you ask them to do and with this kind of foundation long ears training is impeccable and they're ready willing and able to engage in any kind of photos and filming that you might ask them to do now you asked me too if there was anything that i would like to share when you do training that is segmented i'm going to teach them to side pass i'm going to teach them to bow i'm going to teach them to do this or that there is no continuity and there's no logical progression and the animals get anxious about it. Everything gets a little diluted and resistance comes in and all of that. When we were filming and doing the narration for Jasper, the story of a mule, with animator Bill Melendez and our narrator Lee Horsley, Lee and I went for a ride on the mules and I noticed that he had a scar on his face. So I asked him about it. During the shoot, he was thrown to the ground when his horse tripped and fell, and he fell right on the side of his face. He broke his jaw, and he broke his nose. And that's when I discovered, when he was telling me the story, I discovered how merciless Hollywood could be 
because they told him, they took him to the hospital, they fixed him, and then they put him right back on the set to finish the filming. Right yeah. afterwards. Mm. With them, it's all about the money. I think Lee decided that day that he would rather ride a mule. You bet. But see, the mules, they insist that you do this in a logical and sequential order so that they're ready to do anything that you ask them to do. In the next episode, uh, we're going to talk about the different mule movies that have been done and how mules have been in the background of most movies while the horses were the stars. But in more modern times now that I've done this program and done it so detailed, people are getting braver with mules and they're not looking at them the same way anymore. So now they're getting some starring roles and that's a great thing. That is cool. This is so exciting. This is awesome. Okay, and you have a website. I have a website at wwwlucky 3 Ranch. All spelled out, not the number three. And under training, you're going to see all the different things that I have been talking about today. And the list is going to be on a Mule Crossing article that will follow this post on Facebook. You can find the Mule Crossing article right after this on Facebook. And you can also find it under training on the website. We have a children's website, so you can take a look at the children's series at jasperthemule.com. You are welcome to call me. I answer all my phone calls at 800-816-7566. Or you can email me directly at meredith at lucky3ranch.com. All right, Meredith, you have a wonderful afternoon and we will talk soon. If you'd like to be a guest on the show or a sponsor, send me an email. Everycowgirlsdream at gmail.com. Gotta go. My mule is looking for me. Meal Talk is an Every Cowgirl's Dream production.